Quick announcement about people gathering cabs at the end of the meeting. Okay, hi everybody. Um, some people have been asking about going to airports and transportation to airports. Um, it's really easy to just grab cabs or Ubers to share right outside, but because I don't know where people are going, if you want to split a cab to any of the airports right after the meeting, we can meet right in the back of the room and that way people can have a chance to sort of see what airports people are going to and we can decide if yellow cabs or Ubers are the best way to lift via whatever or the best way to go. Um, and we can just coordinate from there. So right at four o'clock, we can just meet right in the back of the room. Cool, thanks. Airports are a pain in the neck. I actually advise you not to bother. <laughs> <laughs> so we are now moving to our last formal uh, session of the meeting um, before we get into uh, the final session, which will, uh, be focused on reflections on the things we've heard over the last uh, two days. Uh, and this session has more of a, a methodologic uh, focus uh, to it, asking the question essentially whether we are looking in the right way at the things that we are uh, looking at. And the first of uh, our speakers uh, 
is uh, Rachel Grob, who is uh, a senior scientist in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, her research has focused on issues including patients' experience with health care, patient voices and uh, their influence on health policy, uh, and the social impact of genetics. Uh, she uh, is a graduate of Wesleyan University, has an MA in Health Advocacy from Sarah Lawrence, and uh, her PhD in Sociology from the Graduate Center uh, of the City University of New York. Uh, her most recent book is Testing Baby, The Transformation of Newborn Screening, Parenting, and Policymaking. Uh, and today, as you can see, she's going to be speaking on qualitative research, robust but marginalized. Rachel. Thank you, Paul. And good afternoon, everybody. All right. So I am going to start off um, with a few disclaimers. I am offering reflections here. I did not do the kind of formal synthesis or meta-analysis that Chris got stuck with for this conference. <laughs> um, for the data, um, which I'm gonna share with you to kind of illustrate my claim that we have some robust findings about the impact of genetic information, which will focus on newborn screening. Um, and I think there are still some questions about how generalizable what I've studied more deeply for newborn screening is to genomic information generally, so that can be a topic for discussion. I also want to say I'm a contributor to the interpretivist form of qualitative research that I'm going to examine here. I'm going to tell you what that is in a minute. Um, and I'm sort of an interested party in that way. As Paul mentioned, I've, I've written a book on the subject that I'm going to be um, illustrating here. But I also want to say I do a lot of other kinds of qualitative and mixed methods research. So um, the bridging function, which I'm going to foreshadow um, my advocacy for, is something that I, I, I live in my own practice. And then I also just wanted to mention that um, there's more than one Dr. Grab here because my dad got to come um, be here, which is an extraordinary treat. So he is not responsible for anything that I say. <laughs> but I, I do just want to acknowledge that um, the habit of asking perspicacious questions and also of being really open-minded and avoiding strident stridency is something that I've really tried to learn from my dad. Okay, so my focus today, as you might gather from the title of the talk, is um, to talk about a specific kind of qualitative research that I think has generated really robust empirical findings um, and some corresponding sort of conceptual models or ways that we can really think about the impact of genomics. Um, and that these findings have been systematically, although not intentionally, marginalized. This is not about a conspiracy theory at all, but I just want to highlight for our collective consideration some of the ways that we don't tend to take account of the findings that are generated from this particular kind of method. Um, and then I hope we can all talk about why this matters. I think it matters if we care about well-rounded public discourse and informed policy, um, and also just sort of knowing where we are um, as a society and, a, and as individuals. So this has already been teed up quite a bit, this idea of different research utility paradigms, and uh, most people here will not be at all um, surprised by these kinds of assertions about quantitative data being useful because of the generalizability of findings um, from the study sample to broader groups. Um, and there are often, we often think of the qualitative data as helping to illustrate modal findings. Allison and I had a good laugh about the fact that uh, we both have this kind of bell curve in our remarks, um, but also looking at what's happening at the margins, and that can be problems, that can be benefits. I think it's an open question whether the things that happen at the margins are going to get ironed out, for example, as technologies um, diffuse more broadly and problems with implementation get solved, or whether what we're identifying there are maybe harbingers of um, larger phenomenon that we might see later on. Um, 
I also um, just want to give a nod to some common, but I would claim sort of debatable assumptions about qualitative research. It's service role um, in rounding out big quantitative studies. It's um, sort of marginalization as just pilot or exploratory work before we get down to the real business um, of a large quantitative study or its role in sort of salvaging, floundering research. Oh, our quantitative results didn't show much, but we have this kind of mixed methods design, and with our qualitative results, we can at least say something or explain a little bit about what is going on. I am gonna talk today about interpretivist or critical qualitative research, but I wanna spend a minute just laying out um, some thoughts, drawing on Joan Eakin, who's cited at the bottom of this slide, about different qualitative research paradigms. So the positivist or post-positivist um, paradigm has uh, a variety of assumptions about um, the reality of, of um, the reality being separated from human interpretations. It tends to look at ways of catalog cataloging concepts. Um, it's often reported in quantitative terms, so we're doing qualitative research on which we can then perform frequencies so that we can quantify our qualitative results. It tends to see investigators as a source of bias um, and look at ways of minimizing that bias. And it focuses a lot, um, not just on methods, but on procedures. So in some ways, it, it, it mirrors um, some of what we see when we try to assess quality in quantitative measurement. Interpretivist or critical um, qualitative research instead looks at um, more interpretive and language dependent research processes, it sees the investigator as a source of insight. Um, and some of the methods that it uses that you might be familiar with are, for example, um, intensive interviews or ethnography. It also invites participants in the research to self-reflect and gain insight. It sees um, the phenomena that it's investigating as in evolving often throughout the course of the study. And um, it relies heavily on analytic interpretation and particularly on induction, which um, from my perspective anyway, as um, a very self-proclaimed fan of induction, gives it a lot of empirical power because these kinds of interpretivist studies often come at a social phenomena assuming that there's something to be learned, but trying really hard not to make too many assumptions about what that is. So instead of being hypothesis driven, um, seeing what it is we can learn if we constantly remind ourselves not to inject our biases and to keep a check on them while all the while understanding that it's impossible to be freed from them entirely. Um, but what an important I think, um, and potentially transformative process or practice to go into your research trying to check yourself constantly um, so that you're not seeing what you expect to find, but rather learning um, what you are hearing as you deeply listen and what you are seeing and observing. Um, Joan Eakin often says everything's data for a qualitative researcher, so it's not only about um, sort of the data point, but about um, what, what you observe and see around you as you do your research. So I am gonna talk here um, about some repeated findings about newborn screening. Um, and I use that term so that uh, to distinguish it from, again, a systematic review or a metasynthesis. Um, but these are some things that came up repeatedly in um, research on this topic um, and that I think have uh, some good um, empirical evidence behind them. I am drawing on a variety of sources, but particularly on uh, the book that I wrote on newborn screening called Testing Baby that came out in 2011 and one that Stefan Timmermans and Mara Bookbinder published in 2013 called Saving Babies. 
this kind of interpretivist research is actually better suited to a book than an article format um, because there's a lot to say and a lot of sort of conceptual modeling and theory building that goes around that. So what are some of the things that we found about newborn screening um, that are arguably very robust? Again, I'm using this as a case study to locate us. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about some of the ways that they may have been marginalized. Um, and I'm not going to take the time here to talk about what newborn screening is, save mentioning that it is a universal screening program performed mostly um, without parental consent and that it expanded largely, as probably most of you know, um, around the turn of the century and during that first decade. So this research looks at um, the impact on families who got positive screens for cystic fibrosis, that's what I did, or for metabolic disorders, that's what Stefan and Mara did. So, um, repeated finding number one, transient disruptions during infancy can cause lasting regret. And this also got teed up a little bit yesterday. Um, usually we look at whether there's vulnerable child syndrome or impacts on bonding by seeing whether there are lasting effects as measured through um, standardized and validated quantitative instruments um, that measure that and we, um, we determine that there is not an impact if those effects um, are not determined to have been lasting. What I found in my work, and it was mirrored in um, not only Stefan and Mara's work, but other qualitative research, is that um, while newborn screening um, does not result in long-term disruptions in the parent-child relationship, it can create powerful long-term forms of regret about lost opportunity, squandered time, and the unalterable reality of having ever withheld unconditional love and commitment from a child with abnormal screening results. Um, so these narratives don't refute fond findings that, that bonding repairs over time, but they highlight qualitative aspects of experience that aren't easily captured. So each and every child, a parent that I interviewed, no matter how hard the initial period was, found a way to get through this and profoundly connect with the child, but some of the most moving moments in these emotion-filled interviews came when parents described first how they held themselves at a remove and then how they built bridges back to their children. So here's one parent talking about holding her baby at a distance. It seemed like it was six months to a year before I felt, okay, I know what I'm doing now and I really feel close to this baby. I think I had to mourn the loss of the healthy child I had. You know, I had to go through that mourning process of, okay, I don't have a healthy child. This isn't the baby I thought I had. And then here's a parent talking about building that bridge back again, always recounted with tears. I went up there to her room with my camera and I sat there and I held her and I dressed her up and we took pictures and I just talked to her for a while. And it was, it, it was, it, it helped. It helped a lot just to tell her that, you know, I'm her mom and it's okay and we're gonna take care of her and we're gonna have a lot of fun and not to worry about whatever's gonna happen because we'll take care of it. And I sat there and explained it all to her and it kind of put a perspective on how I felt about her because obviously I cared. But again, this doesn't mean that the bonding issues raised by early di diagnosis weren't both devastating in the short run and resonant over a much longer period of time. In fact, it's precisely the contrast between what they felt at first and what they came to feel later that remains an open wound for these parents. As one father expresses the sequence of emotions, at first, quote, you have this feeling that is like, I shouldn't get close to this baby because he could be gone in a couple of days. Later, though, you are, quote, super, super guilty about having felt you shouldn't spend time with your child because he doesn't deserve not having me because he might be gone. Okay. Another finding, um, again, repeated is 
about new diagnostic odysseys. Um, we know newborn screening is designed to minimize um, the diagnostic odysseys that come with not knowing what's wrong with your child if your child's symptomatic. Um, in my book, I've got a chapter called Diagnostic Odysseys, Old and New. Um, and around the same time, Timmermans and Bookbinder famously uh, coined this phrase of children who become patients in waiting um, to describe this experience of hovering for an extended period um, between normality and illness. Um, and here's a graph from their book, Saving Babies, that shows you know, you're true positive and you retest uh, over time. Um, after the positive newborn screen, or you're determined to be a false positive, and that wavy line in the middle shows the patient in waiting subset of their population. They followed 75 patients who had an abnormal screen for a metabolic disorder, and 42 of them um, were characterized in their analysis as patients in waiting um, for uh, an extended period of time, in some cases more than six months. So what are some of the typical issues facing patients in waiting? This will harken back to some of what Allison said yesterday. Um, diagnostic uncertainty due to a lack of knowledge. Fundamental questions about whether results are true or false positive. Mixed messages from clinicians. The disease could be serious, but not in your case. Or it is serious, but you may not have it. Um, unanswered questions. Um, and. Uh, a sense that not only are your questions unanswered, but they're sort of unanswerable because the knowledge isn't out there yet and parents becoming aware of that um, sort of juxtaposition of having been tested, but uh, questions remain unanswerable. Um, and a, a sense that while clinicians and geneticists eventually came to regard um, many of these cases as false positives, it was much more difficult for parents to let the impact of having had a child as a patient in waiting fade away. And here's a quick quote um, from my book about what it's like to live in this land. I think the key thing with an asymptomatic child, to me, said one father, was that you're constantly walking the tension between saying, I'm in denial about this because you don't feel like anything's wrong, and feeling like you have to acknowledge it mentally, or the gods of irony, or the gods of poetic justice will make something actually wrong with your child. It's like when you get on a plane, you have to acknowledge plane flying is dangerous, or the plane will crash. He's growing well, he's meeting all his physical and developmental milestones, and so on and so forth. But you still don't know what to tell people because you don't fit into any of the groups. You don't fit into the something is really wrong with my child group, but you don't fit into my child is perfectly healthy group. So there's like, there isn't any place for you. Okay, third, um, parents feel grateful for newborn screening, and they also feel increasingly personally responsible for their child's health. Um, and this juxtaposition, I think, explains a lot of why on surveys and in this kind of interpretivist qualitative research endeavor as well, parents are in favor of newborn screening and they feel good about it, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not profoundly changed by it. Um, parents are, you know, newborn screening is supposed to, to save lives, it's supposed to um, prevent not only mortality but morbidity, but it doesn't happen on its own. It happens through the practices that parents implement to keep their child safe. In the case of cystic fibrosis, a very elaborate prophylactic regime including enzymes and chest percussions and vests and keeping them away from infection in the case of metabolic disorders, um, special feeding and making sure there's no fasting and watching closely your child and so forth. So many forms of vigilance are characteristic of um, this state for parents. Um, looking, always looking for that first symptom to emerge, as one father put it, I'm a super hypochondriac parent. You're always sort of at these two extremes where it's like, am I really doing the right thing or am I just being overprotective because there's actually nothing wrong with him? 
There's also a phenomenon of parents sort of measuring their success as parents in terms of the child's health status. I feel I'm succeeding if she's doing well, they say. She's doing great, then I know I'm doing the right thing. But of course, the obverse of this is blaming yourself when symptoms do appear. So lots of forms of testimony of parents saying, it's my fault that an infection occurred, it's my fault that a crisis occurred. So an increasing sense of personal responsibility. And the analysis um, that, that in both of these books arises from this is that it's really difficult in this situation for parents to develop and maintain any kind of critique of newborn screening because that involves um, saying to yourself that all of your vigilance and your hard work and the parenting style that you've evolved has been for naught because your child would have been healthy anyway. It's more satisfying and more adaptive to believe that newborn screening was important, that preventive care is what's responsible for continued good health, um, and to feel grateful instead of critical. So again, when we look at sort of where there are disjunctures between the qualitative and quantitative data, um, I think there's some real explanatory power here. At the same time, a small but articulate minority of patients did question if newborn screening was useful um, and objected to disjunctures between newborn screening rhetoric um, or what it says it does and their own experience. So here's one example of that phenomenon. The way the literature is written, one parent said, is there's a lot of things that I think are outright lies. For example, it says the newborn screenings are only things that have a clear treatment course, and that's just not true. They're screening for all types of things, and we have absolutely no idea what to do about them. Essentially, what you're telling somebody is, we have noted this, we don't really understand it, and we don't know what you can do about it. Good luck with that. I think it's very odd, and I think also the genetics people are not used to dealing with asymptomatic kids. They're used to only seeing kids who have symptoms, because that was the only way kids got to them previously. They worry about malpractice issues, and I always worry about the nature of society, of having the influence on a medical establishment. I think they're afraid to say to you, some kids are okay. I feel like they don't want to get your hopes up, even if that is essentially what the evidence for your kid is suggesting to them. Okay. And then, finally, um, the urgency narrative, um, as I've called it, the sort of mantra, newborn screening saves lives, newborn screening saves lives, um, and the pushback against that by any other accounts of newborn screening has been notable um, in much of this work. Um, and I'll give you just a few examples of how um, that story um, is very safely guarded by, um, by policymakers, by other scientists, by some um, other researchers, um, and by advocates in the newborn screening domain, um, which we can talk about um, during the Q&A if you'd like. Some people had asked at an earlier session some questions about the role of advocacy, and uh, that has a, a, a really big effect here. Um, so this idea of um, being, being pushed back on, don't tell the counter narrative, um, and developing another story when those who have suffered have had so much to lose, being objectable, objectionable. Um, and I'll just give you one example of a sort of public dialogue about this when Stefan and Mara published their first journal article about patients in waiting. They received um, a, a letter to the journal editor claiming that what they had published was a disservice to advances in newborn genetic screening. Um, and there was a lively dialogue there, which I can tell you more about uh, later if you want, but we don't have time here. So, how does qualitative research get marginalized? I've already suggested um, some of the ways that that might happen um, and some of the ways that that research is self-aware about some of the ways that that might happen um, in one exemplar area, that of newborn screening. But I want to talk here about some um, systematic issues related to method that I hope will be useful for all of us to consider together. So 
Um, we've talked already a little bit about the rise of systematic reviews and uh, meta-analyses, or at least referred to them as an implicit um, super valuable resource for understanding a lot of data in a way that makes sense, um, and certainly they are. But in terms of uh, what they ha leave out, um, as well as what they highlight, certainly the exclusion of qualitative findings is um, a potential shortcoming, and Chris highlighted this already. Um, the two uh, systematic reviews that we had as advanced reading for this conference, which I know came as news to some of you, um, but Eric did indeed send us out some articles. Um, and here was one of them, the, the screening for Down syndrome, does it cause anxiety in pregnant women? Um, and that systematic review did not include uh, qualitative studies because it included only quantitative studies. And similarly, the one that we looked at about Huntington's disease um, excluded qualitative findings as well. Um, there's also a phenomenon that's been identified by um, commentators, including Margaret Sandalowski um, and others, um, Kristen Bell, anthropologist, of evidence-based medicine creep from clinical arenas um, for which it was designed, right, originally as a way to assess the comparative effectiveness of clinical interventions to looking at behavioral um, or social phenomena. So um, the spread of this concept is, is something for us to think seriously about Kristen Bell and her critique of systematic reviews of physician advice in promoting smoking cessation, for example, trenchantly problematizes this form of creep, demonstrating, for example, that the review of this um, communication issue in clinical care compared physician advice across many nations and a span of 35 years without accounting for any contextual factors relating to culture or changes in tobacco policy or in social policy. She also notes that the assumption behind such reviews is a positivist framework that assumes, quote, human behaviors can be isolated intervened in and modified in much the same way as human physiology. So not too much room for the interpretative fist qualitative um, research canon in that paradigm. Um, and then there's also this issue of what happens when we try to synthesize results. Um, and I think that the critique around the synthesis of qualitative research and the issues that arise when we do that can also, at least many parts of it, apply to quantitative research. I am um, taken by this idea from Sandalowski and Voiles et al. about distorting data into clarity when we try to create such a synthesis. Um, and here's a little of what they have to say about that. No matter whether a review includes reports solely of qualitative, quantitative, or of both qualitative and quantitative studies, data are never simply extracted as given in these reports, but rather they are transformed, transposed, converted, tabulated, funnel and forest plotted or otherwise manipulated, modified, and reconfigured to permit the comparison of the previously incomparable and the combination of the previously uncombinable. So um, the idea here is that the coherence is the result of a lot of efforts to produce this sort of clarity. Um, and this is, again, a topic that I hope we can take up together because it's really, really important to be able to do these kinds of syntheses. But the methodological challenges are huge, and it is easier to work with quantitative measures, arguably, than particularly with the kind of interpretivist data um, that we're talking about. If you can quantify your qualitative fi findings, it may be easier to combine them. But if you're working with um, conceptual findings and theoretical constructs, the process of distorting into clarity um, is 
arguably more difficult than ever. I also want to talk a little bit about recommended standards of evidence. Um, guideline developers and groups like the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders and Newborns and Children, which makes recommendations about um, what we should consider when looking at candidate additional conditions to screen for as we develop our capacity to identify more and more genetic and genomic markers or their um, metabolites. So um, as noted by Eakin and Mikovlowski, qualitative research that's largely narrative that relies fundamentally on language-based data and whose relevance is not secured through the numerical calculus of confidence intervals, p-values, and the like presents problems for this uh, process of recommending standards of evidence. It presents problems for integrating interpretivist qualitative research into such standards and guidelines because, quoting again, guideline development processes typically draw on approaches that were developed by clinical epidemiologists and health services researches, researchers as part of the promotion of evidence-based decision-making in healthcare. Um, and again, what gets included in those approaches and what gets excluded um, is something I hope we can think more about. An example around the recommended standards of evidence and guideline development from newborn screening is illustrative. Um, Aaron Goldenberg, who many of us know, um, and co-authors in 2016 published a piece about um, the use of um, the, the assessment of harms in the development of standards around newborn screening for the Secretary's Advisory Committee and the procedures as they define them in that piece. Um, I will read to you. The process for defining potential harms from newborn screening reviewed in the frameworks from other public health evidence review processes and were adapted to newborn screening by experts in systematic review newborn screening programs, and bioethics, yay bioethics, with input from and approval by the advisory committee. So note the absence of um, qualitative research expertise in that process. Um, and the paradigm for assessing harms that they um, adopt in that recommended framework are to systematically categorize and assess the magnitude of potential harms related to preventive screening. And their conclusion is that the potential impact of harms depends on several key considerations. One, the number of children and or families at risk of harm. Two, the severity of those potential harms for each child or family. Three, the certainty or likelihood that a particular harm would happen, and four, the timing of when the harm would occur. So again, you can see um, the kind of data that will most easily be taken up into the evidence standard guideline. Okay, and then finally, I wanna talk a little bit about publication biases. Um, and. There are a couple of dimensions of this. One is the expectations for how findings are presented. And um, many journals, the, the standards, the requirements for what sections um, you share your data in, um, the sort of, you know, the question, the methods, the, the analysis, the sample size, and all of that really emphasizes the proceduralist side of methods. Um, it keeps the results and the discussion separate in a way um, that is not most um, useful for the writing up of some of these interpretivist kind of qualitative results. Um, and at the same time, there's often limited space for or interest in qualitative studies, perhaps especially in clinical journals, which as we know have a tremendous influence on the sort of knowledge production and uptake processes in our society. 
So I wanted to share here an open letter to the British Medical Journal, journal editors on qualitative research from 2016. Um, 76 senior academics from 11 countries wrote to the BMJ editors asking them to reconsider their policy of rejecting qualitative research on the grounds of low priority, and they challenged the journal to develop a proactive scholarly and pluralist approach to research that aligns well with its stated mission. Um, and just for visual impact, here are all the people uh, who signed on to that letter. Um, and the response that they got to the letter that they wrote from the BMJ was, thank you so much for your letter. But um, arguably, the ideal place for publication of many qualitative papers will be journals that are targeted at the specialist audience to whom the findings are especially pertinent. And I want to be careful here not to um, lump all journal editors or all clinical journals into this category. Um, and I think there's actually been a significant and well-documented rise in interest in qualitative research. But primarily, what I've characterized as the positivist or post-positivist kind that fits most easily um, into these kind of journal styles. Or you can publish in the targeted journals with the specialist audience of um, other social scientists, essentially, um, where your chance of having an influence on things like the development of evidence guidelines or the informing of public policy or even the enriching of public discourse are not nearly as rich as they would be if they're published in journals where um, media outlets, for example, like to garner their stories. So, um, where do we go from here? What can qualitative researchers do? And what can all of us do? So I think um, for qualitative researchers, I think it's really important for us to stay true to what we're good at doing. It's really easy to feel like we should um, do what's most adaptive and what's going to have the greatest influence. Um, but I would invite those of us who do this kind of work to continue to produce this work, um, even though in many ways it may remain at the margins. It's an important contribution, and we can help each other keep doing that. I think it's critical that we study experiences that people are having, patients, diverse and plural experiences, as well as the opinions and perceptions that people have. It's really, really different to ask somebody what they think than to spend time with them exploring what has happened to them or what is happening to them or to observe that in situ in an ethnographic kind of setting. Um, and I think we often allied those things. Um, and I would really um, exhort us all to give patients experiences and thus their plural voices um, a primary place in our research canon. And then I think connecting what we've learned to real world change is essential. I've talked a little bit about the conceptual modeling and theory development that is a critical methodological standard for um, interpretivist kind of work. But that does not mean that it's not um, meant to be useful. And I would um, hope that we will continue to really heed the call to do that. And I'm going to read you what I think is a really beautiful quote from um, Sandalowski from a keynote address about a decade ago that talks about this. The turn to evidence-based practice, she said, moves us as qualitative health researchers to take more stock of our stories, to showcase what and how they reveal, clarify, distill, elaborate, extend, complicate, confirm, refute, explain, reframe, personify, individualize, specify, sensitize, persuade, evoke, and provoke. 
As researchers and practice disciplines, we have a special obligation to conduct transformative inquiry by activating this taxonomy of use. That is, to show the beneficial outcomes for the public health of these revelations, clarifications, distillations, elaborations, extensions, and the like. So one way we can do that, I think, is by making our qualitative findings broadly available and usable. And there is um, at least one international movement underway in many countries to do this with public-facing resources that make those data available. And I'm sure you all may know of other issues. Um, I chatted at lunch with some folks about sort of data sharing agreements. I think there's a lot of ways we can make that movement. I hope we can talk about them. What about the research community at large? Um, what can we all do? I hope that we can have less polarization. I don't think there's a lot of it in this room. Um, we're not a very scrappy bunch. <laughs> but um, I think there is a little bit of a sort of Venus and Mars phenomenon that happens here. And even if you look at sort of the gendered um, division generally of labor among researchers, there's a sort of softer science, the qualitative side, and then the sort of what does the evidence really show and how do we know that these um, results are not just exploratory and have um, greater significance or not. So I think um, sort of honing our dialogue so that we can find a language um, that bridges for us is really healthy, as is um, humility on all sides, the promotion of dialogue. If you have questions about that, you should ask my dad, because he's an expert. Um, but I, I, we can do with that, and I really want to thank the Hastings Center and Columbia for promoting this dialogue, which I see as a really important intervention in this space. And then I think on a very practical note that serious ongoing attention to the issue of qualitative evidence and systematic reviews and metasyntheses um, is worth our collective attention because by no means should we throw the wonderful um, baby, as it were, of trying to look across studies at what we're learning and sum it up and be able to get hold of it for, for dialogue, for discourse, for policy, for um, guidelines and so forth. That's a really precious baby, um, but we've got some great work to do uh, to get better at distorting into clarity. So um, with that, I'm just going to show you really quickly. This is even a subset of um, some of the work I've drawn on. And I really want to acknowledge the Center for Patient Partnerships at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which gives me a lot of time to think about questions like the one um, Eric charged me to think about today, and um, the ICTER funding mechanism at my university, and the Hastings Center, which is not responsible for what I've said, but um, I had a wonderful experience being a visiting scholar there, um, and also Emily, who helped me with the slides. Wow, that was a tour de force. Fantastic. Um, Rachel, we're so lucky to have you in this community. Um, before I was doing work in bioethics, I was trained as a research methodologist in both quantitative and qualitative methods. And I want to push further than you. We don't only have publication bias. I mean, and you went out of your way to say it's not a conspiracy, and I completely agree it's not a conspiracy, but it's ignorant. Let's just call it out as ignorance. Why do I say that? Randomized clinical trials are seen as the gold standard. What are they the gold standard of? That a correlation is not likely to be happening by chance. There's nothing causative about our gold standard. Only qualitative research can speak to causation. So. This is so fundamental and so misunderstood like, like the editors at, at BMJ. It's just ignorant. And we need to do a better job about this. Now, I was really influenced by two persons from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jerome Bruner, the 
world famous developmental psychologist, formed the research institute that I worked at for 37 years in Boston. And he wrote a book called um, Actual Minds, Possible Worlds. In, now here's a person with the scientific, science cred, right? Writing about two paradigmatic ways of knowing the world. And since most of us don't do lit surveys back to 1986, I wanted everybody to know about this book. <laughs> yes, it came out in 86, Actual Minds, Possible Worlds, and he's talking about the way in which we learn in these two very different ways and how they are complementary and absolutely need each other. So I really wanted just to get that into the record. And the other thing I wanted to get into the record was my actual mentor at Harvard when I was studying the qualitative side of things, and that's Joseph Maxwell, who has written a whole series of sage books on qualitative research methods. So if we're going to try to redress the ignorance that um, we're plagued with, that's a really good place to start. And then the last thing I wanted to say is a little more personal. One of my children was born two months early, and um, while there wasn't anything genetic that was being discussed, I was very moved by what, the first time I heard your, your, your work, before you even wrote the book, it was really deeply touched me because I was a mother like the mothers you interviewed who was terrified and um, kept putting his, I was in the hospital for a long time after his birth and he was in a different hospital and my husband would bring me photographs of him from the NICU and I couldn't look at them. I just kept sticking them under the mattress. So for 10 days I had photographs under the mattress. I was utterly terrified. I don't think any of the standardized questionnaires that would have looked to see if I had depression or anxiety would have detected that I had a problem. But I had a really big problem. So I have, feel the same way. I'm very reluctant to call for standardized measures. They can be standardized, but not relevant. And I think that's what your research points out. So um, qualitative data is not just anecdotal, and it's a way of knowing the world that we really have to embrace. So thank you so much for those great comments. Thanks, Millie. I feel like um, <laughs> one of the things that happens when you do this kind of work is that people, like Millie just did, sort of come up to you and say, yes, this resonates with me. Um, we don't have the same methods for validation as exist on the quantitative side, but I, I take it as evidence of striking um, a, a note that resonates when people who think there should only be one story show up in your office and tell you to stop doing what you're doing, and people who feel like their voice has been missing from the public discourse get in touch and say, yeah, that happened to me. And, and many of you who were part of a different project at the Hastings Center met um, such a parent, um, Kristen Ishgro, who, uh, who got in touch with me through the book exactly that way. So I don't know what we can do with that form of validation, um, but it's something that I think we should think and write about. What, is it, what does it mean to strike that kind of note, and can we proudly um, offer that as um, uh, something that matters with respect to the public intervention we've made by publishing these kinds of things instead of being shy about it. And I have to say, last night when I was thinking about this talk, I was like, well, should I read from like a blog and emails that people send me about this research? Or is that methodologically funky? Um, and I think it just shows the way that we sort of internalize these particular standards. Um, I'm as guilty of it as anyone. So thanks for the encouragement, Millie. So, Rachel, I understand the tendency to, for qualitative researchers to feel as if they're under siege for all the reasons that, that you laid out. But I'm wondering if you could reflect critically for a moment on qualitative approaches themselves. Because I'd be curious to know if you think any of the critique of qualitative approaches actually has validity and could be incorporated by qualitative researchers in enhancing either the real or apparent or both validity of their um, 
findings. And, and let me sort of give a, a couple of um, examples. I think a lot of people wonder about sample size <laughs> in a lot of qualitative studies. The notion that if you talk to 20 people, you've exhausted the universe, and now you know everything there is to know about a phenomenon, and I'm, I'm caricaturing it, but um, that's a concern, I think, that you hear from quantitative researchers. Uh, the notion that sample selection uh, does not have to incorporate approaches that at least attempt to be more representative of the universe of people who are out there in a given category. And of course, that goes along with sample mm -hmm. size, uh, because if you still have a small sample, it doesn't matter how, how representative y y you try to, to be. There's also a, a methodologic critique. I'm actually reading a, an interesting book now by a, a law professor named um, Stephen Lubit. It's called Interrogating Ethnography, uh, in which he attempts to hold ethnographic approaches to the legal standard of evidence and asks to what extent, if you put ethnography on trial, would the evidence be persuasive and points I, I think to you know a number of uh, troubling examples of um, failures for example to share data for confirmation um, the absence often of um, uh, uh, interpretation by more than one uh, Person, so you're getting one person's view is, without an effort to, to assess the reliability of the judgments that are being made based on the data, et cetera. He, he, goes, he goes on. So, you know, I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, is there something positive that could be drawn out of the pushback that qualitative methods have gotten so that going forward, the doubters will have a basis for increased uh, belief in the validity and reliability of, of the findings. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question, and there's probably more in it than I can respond to in the remaining eight minutes or so that we have. Um, Apps can, can qualitative researchers do a better job? Absolutely. Is there a lot of crappy qualitative research? Absolutely. Is there more crappy qualitative research than there is crappy mixed methods or quantitative research? I don't think so. Should we on board, I'll say we from the sort of qualitative research committee, um, all critiques and rigorous questions that make us better at our job? Of course. Should we abide by a dismissive note like that I read from the BMJ, basically saying stay in your corner? No. So I think um, inquiry about the improvement of methods is healthy for all researchers. Um, to take up just a few of your specific questions, I'll speak personally. I am a huge fan of systematic sampling techniques um, like maximum variation like um, using some of the kinds of national panels that Matt just talked about to select folks. Um, I am a huge fan of team-based science and of team-based analysis and of multidisciplinary inquiry. Um, I think it was you who charged us, or maybe it was Jim, um, to think like sort of more about the social and less about the psycho and the psychosocial effects. I think psychologists and anthropologists and social scientists and clinicians and economists and um, all, all kinds of folks do a better job when they do it together. I think um, the place where patient experience research in particular and patient engagement meet that you referred to when you um, talk about sort of sharing results back with people who informed your qualitative research is a really fertile ground. Um, I'm of two minds about it. I, I keep thinking back to Chris, your sort of number one and number two directly contradict each other kind of thing. Like on the one hand, when you're do doing conceptual modeling and theory development, the people you interviewed or who were the subjects of your ethnography may not agree 
in their opinions with everything that you say, although they may be able to affirm that, yes, you've captured their experiences. On the other hand, I think um, we have a lot to learn from community-based participatory research and action research sorts of methodologies and from the ongoing engagement of people who tell their stories to inform qualitative research in the analysis and dissemination and use of that data, and it's a topic near and dear to my heart, and there's really a burgeoning field. Um, the one thing I would sort of caution in your question is, if it were there, an implication that this sort of grappling is not already actively ongoing in the field. I think qualitative researchers are extraordinarily introspective, and I would invite my quantitative colleagues in the room to um, observe and celebrate that and see if um, there are some ways that we do that that you might be interested in taking up. So I give the charge right back to you. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> Hi, I, I enjoyed that very much. And a lot of what you said, I, I should note, really was consistent with what I saw in the literature looking at these issues that we're addressing in this conference, that we did see uh, a, a decent chunk of the paper, the meta-analyses or the uh, systematic reviews I looked at didn't look at um, the qualitative research at all. The ones where it was looked at, there's a wide degree of variation in whether or not it actually integrated any of that component in that. Certainly, um, sometimes you'd see references to it, but very often it didn't make it into any sort of substantial component of its discussion. And when we're talking, one of your points was to be, for us to engage in dialogue and be humble. I'll note my own personal experience having written a systematic review on this issue and, and having, uh, I, in my own defense, one of my main points was that, uh, in recommendations, was that we should be doing more qualitative research. But, um, that was one of my main <laughs> points, but, but that being said, when I actually tried to write up what, what I found, uh, what, I, what I generally found is we saw a lot more in the qualitative research, there's a lot more interesting things to say about it, but that I had trouble, the point of this is to sort of, sort of make things simple, to like bring it together and sort of like uh, combine it into something that's a message that says do this or you know, that sort of thing. And, um, I, I remember the real challenges of trying to figure out how to actually integrate the qualitative findings that were there because I wouldn't say, how would I say if I saw, if, if in, in a qualitative study, uh, qualitative research saw, saw a couple people who had X, Y, or Z concern, and in other studies, you know, maybe they, they saw no change in depression, how do I balance those out in a what is a fair way of doing that when you when you have two people against like a, a huge study, and uh, you know how do I think about that in integrating that? So I'm just I'm just curious about your thoughts on like what would a responsible way of doing these systematic reviews and meta analyses? What ha, have you seen that done well? I've saw, seen a couple of examples I kind of liked, but I'm curious about your thoughts on how you would like to see that be improved. Yeah, it's a great question, um, and I think my thoughts are really in the formative stage. I'm not an expert at this by any means, um, but thanks to, to Eric and the conference organizers, for I've been wanting to think about this more. Um, I think numbers are not necessarily the most useful way to get a hold of the qualitative findings while you know fully acknowledging that we don't want you know the one example which may be a complete outlier to drive public policy um, I've actually co-authored a, a piece in the New England Journal called Moving um, from Anecdote to Science and the Capturing of Patient Narratives so you know there's there's danger there on the other hand this issue of sort of what could be a harbinger, what are the conceptual insights that can be gleaned from that, what kinds of questions would we need to ask to find out if this phenomenon is more prevalent. Um, and I don't know exactly how to incorporate that yet into a systematic review, but in the process of doing qualitative research, that's a lot of what happens, right? We start out thinking we want to investigate a few things and we hear things or we observe things that tip us off that we need to go deeper um, and a good sampling methodology can be to follow that thread which is emergent and inductively derived during the research and so how could that 
um, invitation or imperative extend into the synthesis process that happens in systematic review? I don't know. You want to do a project? <laughs> Couple of Wesleyan grads can hit it hard. <laughs> so thank you. We're, we're going to have to move on, but there will be additional time for discussion in the reflection um, period. Thank you very much. Rachel. Next up is uh, Scott Roberts. Um, Scott is an associate professor in health behavior and health education.